Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, really happy to be here. I'm Jennifer Harris from the Washington State Office of the Education Ombuds, located in the governor's office in Washington State. And um, I've, I've never been videotaped before. <laughs> I did not go to any kind of uh, TED Talk University to learn how you do that and look really cool and polished. So we'll just see what we get. Um, also, I wanted to just say, uh, Cadre, this is my first time at Cadre, uh, and it's been a real treat so far, um, not only because uh, of, a, of a sense of having really uh, found a kind of specific tribe of people who, you know, I, f I feel like what we do is, is a bit of a niche, and then you get in a group like this, and suddenly you uh, kind of have that fun experience of being surrounded by people uh, doing what you do, not to mention the um, spread of people from around the country is really um, a treat as well. Uh, when you live in the Pacific Northwest, you're kind of used to being up in this little corner and spend a lot of time kind of hanging out with other people in the corner. And um, so this is really kind of great to get a chance to sort of get viewpoints from different parts of the country because I think it, it reminds me uh, that uh, we really do have kind of a patchwork of different um, subcultures in the U.S. and it certainly, I think, plays out in this area as well. Um, this, sorry, this workshop title is, is a, a little dry. You know, I devised this when I was uh, submitting the proposal topic and I, I went to this appreciative inquiry class this morning where I was kind of reminded about positive reframing and I thought, wow, that title really could have used some work. Um, <laughs> not the most sort of sexy title. Maybe by the end of the workshop, you guys can all help me come up with a, a better one based on uh, mm -hmm. what you've heard. I want to just take a brief second here. There's little piles of materials on the seats here. And uh, I have some extras if people wander in, but I think we're, we're doing OK. So if you don't find one where you're sitting, look in front or in back of you. Um, two other things that I'm going to send around uh, is kind of a, a display copy of sort of more of a full set of the publications that our office uh, puts out. And um, uh, we, when we were first created, and I'll spend more time on that, uh, we had about twice the funding we have now for, because we were a brand new agency, a fraction of the work we do now. And then the recession hit and we've uh, kind of lost our publication budget. So this, uh, many of the materials in here represent a kind of bygone uh, era, era of glory, and we're sort of using them down and then copying them. But um, I, I want you to note that we, many of our materials are available in up to seven, eight languages. Uh, virtually all of our materials are translated into Spanish, and that's uh, for reasons that will become obvious as I go on. That's a very crucial uh, part of us being accessible so I'll send that around if you can kind of just peek through it, but, but don't keep any of those things. And it's a combination of uh, manuals for parents, uh, brochures, um, some other things you'll find in there. And then uh, this I'll send around a little bit later when we get to that part. So before we get going further, um, can I get a little bit of a sense? Maybe this is not such a huge number of people um, that Maybe we can uh, just do some quick introductions so I have a feel for who's in the room. Do you mind starting here? Sure. Uh, Hillary Tabor, I'm with OSEP at the U.S. Department of Education. I am our dispute resolution lead. Okay, great. And I'm Elizabeth Shaver. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Akron School of Law. Okay. Uh, Andy Ulis, I'm the uh, due process coordinator. Karen Rizzo, I'm a SELPA program coordinator in California. Cool. I'm Carrie Smith, I'm Pennsylvania's director of the dispute resolution system. Great, thanks. Susanna Dougal, also with the office for dispute resolution. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Alana Stewart, I'm a wraparound facilitator at Direction Service. Molly McGraw, and I'm also a wraparound facilitator at Direction Service. I'm Cassie Walker, I work on the complete investigator for the state of Washington. Okay. Terry Wilson, coordinator. Thanks. Jennifer O'Malley, Director of Dispute Resolution for Irvine Unified School District. I'm Marjorie Sand, I'm with the uh, Department of Public Instruction in Houston. I'm Carrie O'Brien, I'm with the Indian Health Authority in Florida. I'm Renee Jenkins, I'm the Director of Dispute Resolution and Monitoring of the Florida Department. 
Good, thank you. Uh, so Jennifer Harris, I'm an uh, educator once upon a time, uh, mediator for um, 20, 25 years, and um, attorney, uh, and now in my current role with the Office of the Education Ombuds, where I've been since um, uh, 2000, uh, seven, eight, roughly about uh, one year after the agency was created. Uh, I'm both a policy legal analyst and an education ombuds who works directly with uh, students and families. Uh, quick note, why do we call it an ombuds? We used to be the Office of the Education Ombudsman and then um, our uh, current governor, Jay Inslee, well, a resolution was passed that we had to make everything gender neutral and so it was changed to ombuds. Although uh, there's kind of a funny part about that, which is apparently in Swedish, the word ombuds is gender, ombudsman isn't gender neutral term anyway, but uh, we've had to change all of our materials and get used to saying that. And we'll kind of dive into um, ombuds like mediator is a, is a pretty multifaceted, it's not, uh, we go to some of the uh, US and international ombuds groups and I'm always fascinated by you know, what an incredible array of people uh, are doing this work and in different ways and internally and externally. And so before we got too much farther, one of the uh, items in your materials is uh, the actual uh, revised Code of Washington statute that created us. And I put that in there because um, it's, I thought it might be of uh, academic interest, if nothing else, to people to see how um, a group of kind of a combination of uh, legislators who uh, really cared about the value of uh, family involvement in schools and family access, parent participation, reminding everybody we are a K-12 to uh, ombuds office that serves all educational issues and I'll tell you about just what a large percentage of those end up being special ed. But when the office was created that was not necessarily, it was not focused just on special education. Uh, no office like this had existed in the country at that time, a state level K to 12 uh, ombuds office that was completely outside of any <coughs> department of education. And so I think, you know, the legislators and the stakeholders were trailblazing. We've been trailblazing ever since then. Um, and uh, we were handed legislative language that we have done our best to uh, serve the intent of and does guide us and the parts in red are some of the language that I think is particularly um, interesting there was you know this is the really the very first section of the statute emphasizes the importance of providing uh, information to parents and students and others regarding their rights and responsibilities and then in the second section uh, emphasizing that an ombuds is someone who is uh, recognize judgment, independent, objective, and with integrity. I'm just curious if anybody kind of, if anything jumps out about that sort of job description, as it were. Is there any words that you were thinking you might see there that you didn't, don't? Yeah. Yeah, so there's, in your materials you'll see um, there was a, a process set up for appointed by the governor but with input uh, from a panel. Um, so you, I'll let you kind of read that, that bit a little bit more. Um, but uh, any other thoughts on the words that I, that kind of always strike me as kind of interesting, especially in the field of dispute resolution, is that we don't have the words neutral or impartial um, in that core uh, definition. And then at the bottom, it emphasizes that the ombuds may not be an employee of any school district uh, the State Office of Education or State Board of Education. Um, so that's a very important theme that I'll kind of return to again and again is the um, you know, pretty uh, intense level of independence that was created around this office and which I think is still somewhat unusual um, and not entirely easy to accomplish. And uh, so I want to get people's thoughts about that as we go. Ombuds is a is a pretty multifaceted and um, uh, 
if you ever do hang out with a huge convention of <laughs> ombuds, you're going to be amazed at sort of all the different ways there are to manifest and implement the ombuds role. <laughs> Our role, um, as we have uh, forged it, and I, I wanted to kind of put this out in the beginning so that as we kind of mix it up in the discussion, we can kind of, there's some clarity around the version of it that we have uh, honed to, which is um, a very primary thing, listening to concerns and perspectives. Um, it's true that the ombuds is a Swedish word, means one who hears complaints. Um, I think trying to kind of, uh, you know, put a positive frame on that is that people have concerns and people bring perspectives and we're here to listen for that. Um, advocating for consumer access to fair processes. Uh, we often, we also talk about that often as um, advocating for positive student outcomes and fairness in the process. You know, predictability, consistency, and fairness. Um, so then that focus on positive student outcomes. Also, uh, that we make use of really a very wide range of dispute resolution techniques. We are not, um, you know, wedded to one particular approach. We, uh, the ombuds in our office, I'll get a little bit more into kind of our background, um, but uh, people bring sort of a, a rich background professionally, and so, uh, you know, really whatever is going to sort of further agreement. Then an interesting thing that was set up on our statute that we collect data, we identify trends, and then we report those uh, recommendations coming out of that to policymakers, including the governor, the legislature, the state uh, office of education, other relevant uh, stakeholders to improve educational access and outcome. Uh, and uh, we really are there to uh, answer any and all questions for any member of the general public. Okay. So uh, two of us, there's five of us in our office, uh, two, I should say five ombuds plus an executive director and a uh, intake communication specialist. Um, <coughs> So five of us are serving the state, and two of us uh, do have attorney background, um, and the others uh, bring uh, a lot of teaching background, parent coaching. Um, we've had an ombuds who was a um, uh, many years of being a high school counselor and then became a liaison to out-of-home youth for a large nonprofit that worked directly with schools. Um, so there, there is not kind of one formula to what the professional preparation is uh, for an ombuds. Um, obviously, all those who do not bring a, uh, attorney background have to uh, become experts in that very quickly. Um, extensive knowledge in the education system. Um, we were talking at the last uh, session in this room about kind of how important is that. Uh, as somebody who is regularly resolving uh, problems in this area, I think pretty important. Um, and I think, uh, here we have impartial, I'm going to modify that and say, I think our, our preferred claim would be to be kind of multi-partial. I don't think that's a word that has as kind of common um, parlance out there. Uh, but independence is something that is kind of uh, our calling card in a way um, that parents uh, and, and educators, for that matter, uh, know that uh, we have very little stake in any outcome except what uh, works for all the parties involved and reaches, as I said, a good uh, result for the student and where the process was fair and accessible. Uh, we, our, our statute included some uh, pretty good, not 100% robust language on um, confidentiality, saying that education ombuds will treat uh, all matters, including the identities of the students, complainants. And uh, here, this, we consider this to be pretty strong language. Um, individuals from ho whom information is uh, acquired. Uh, so that uh, we interpret really to mean anybody that we work with in the process of doing our work, we have a duty to keep their information confidential. So that's um, going to apply on the family side as well as to the educator side. And that's actually been a great uh, asset for us in terms of over time as familiarity and trust has been built with the um, school side of the system having educators know that they can call us and that we're actually a pretty safe place for them to raise concerns, ask questions themselves, uh, bring up concerns about a situation in their school and know that that information will never leave that conversation without their permission. We cannot intervene in a situation just at the request of an educator. 
um, but we can certainly uh, talk through the problem with them, talk through strategies with them, uh, advise if they can get the parent uh, to contact us, and then kind of complete that triangle. So, again, very, very broad uh, that any parent legal guardian, uh, and that includes people, uh, kinship care, um, and uh, really anyone with questions can call our office, get their questions answered. Um, we have a toll-free number. Uh, we use a language line so that we can communicate with people in 150 different uh, languages. Uh, and then just recently, this about a year ago, uh, we were finally able to uh, do a piece which had been kind of in our sights for a while, which was creating a regional ombuds position in eastern Washington. Uh, like all of the West Coast states, really, there's a kind of significant divide between the west half of the state being um, uh, very uh, urban, and then we have this kind of rural eastern half of the state, and often a pretty big uh, divide in terms of the availability, intensity, and quality of services sometimes between the east and the west side of the state. Uh, Eastern Washington, we have a very, very high uh, Spanish-speaking um, migrant and farm working population. And so we knew that while we were making efforts, we were not entirely getting through to that population. And so about a year ago, we worked it out to uh, hire a Spanish-speaking ombuds who is based in the eastern half of the state. And uh, this has been a great uh, development uh, as far as being able to serve that population more effectively. So who does call OEO? Uh, in fact, and I'm sorry, that's, oh, I'll use that Office of the Education Ombuds. Uh, predominantly parent and guardians. Um, you can see another pretty good pie slice that is community professionals. Uh, and those folks are often either um, I would say usually they are also working with a particular student and are trying to kind of enlarge uh, the circle of um, uh, you know, concerned and interested parties and you know, sor sort of like they're building a, a rap team in a way uh, or calling to get uh, the questions answered. Um, then we have uh, another uh, starting to be smaller um, pie slices here, but the school staff districts or educational service districts uh, which in Washington is a level between the school district and the state ed uh, office. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, regions in the state. And then, so in addition to that first slide that sort of explained the purpose of the office, uh, then this one um, further enumerates the powers and duties of our office. And uh, boy, they were very ambitious. <laughs> we're doing our best to, to um, to do all these things with a very tiny staff, but um, uh, parent involvement materials and uh, information, as I said before, um, identifying what, what are obstacles to uh, parent and community involvement and to identify and recommend uh, strategies for pr uh, improving the success rates of ethnic and, and I'm sorry, uh, racial student groups and students with disabilities with disproportionate academic achievement. So pretty explicit there that we're supposed to pay attention to those students and families who traditionally are not getting equal access to the system um, and potentially to services. Um, I'm gonna send around now, um, and this is not a hypothetical uh, we do have a problem with disproportionality in Washington State. Uh, and a couple of years ago, uh, some outside groups uh, uh, did some pretty comprehensive uh, Freedom of Information Act requests on districts around the state, put together a pretty provocative uh, report on uh, just how disproportionate discipline in the state schools were, throughout the state I should say, uh, discipline for uh, students uh, of color and other marginalized groups. I'm going to pass this around. This is another, sorry, one of a kind, but this is uh, also one that you can go online and access yourself. And, um, and that uh, was really a pretty, uh, I think, valuable and important contribution to the discussion in the landscape. It has um, really kind of caused a, a lot 
of uh, more intense focus. Um, I participated for a year and a half on a statewide discipline task force uh, whose uh, purpose really at this point was to increase the quality and the um, level of disaggregation in data the state was collecting from districts uh, on discipline. And I'll talk a little bit later, <coughs> but uh, um, it's, uh, there's really quite a lot of overlap in my experience between students who are being disciplined, students who are uh, enrolled in special education, you know, and the reverse. Um, I don't, I'm not going to say they're exact proxies for one another, um, but uh, these groups, uh, if they're being disciplined, you can pretty much bet that there's going to be a higher uh, likelihood that they either need to be on an IEP or may be on an IEP mistakenly. Um, and although we all know about, you know, a legal 10-day limit for uh, removing kids on IEPs from their educational setting, uh, we find that um, there's still a lot of discipline that is kind of more constructive removal as far as kids being just removed from the classroom, maybe not a full-blown uh, suspension, but they're out in the hall, they're in the administrator's office, they're still missing a lot of instructional time. So we pay uh, heavy attention to both of those areas. I should have said this before, um, but uh, you know, please interrupt with questions. I really tried to think of a kind of clever uh, group interactive game on this, and I couldn't entirely come up with one. <laughs> so I am here to tell you what we're doing, but I don't want it to feel like something that, you know, um, questions and thoughts on this model as you're hearing about it and what that, what that raises for you are very, very welcome. I'm happy to have this be, you know, as much of a discussion as we can have it be. So, based on, oh yeah, in the back. Uh, so, are you referring to questions in Arizona, um, the questions come from parents to both, for example, the governor's office, the legislature, and the state department of education, and sending counsel around to all the sources to be appropriate person. Mm -hmm. So I would say that it probably works a little bit the same way in that um, our uh, really kind of referrals is what you're saying. They come, did everyone hear that? She was just saying, is it, um, is it a centralized? Um, it is certainly not uh, that we're not the only, sorry, like the only avenue that, that complaints can come into. Um, and. Uh, OSPI, our state education office, for example, they have a, um, a family liaison position uh, in special education whose purpose, it's a one person um, kind of unit in that sense, whose uh, purpose is to answer questions and help parents understand the process. Um, that position used to be um, an odd position and then uh, they sort of uh, changed that. Um, and, you know, there's I mean, lots of people come to us through word of mouth. Sometimes they do get referred by state ed or other units in the education system. Um, we get a lot of referrals from um, people in the uh, healthcare system who are diagnosing disabilities. It's pretty wide, widespread. Um, and I guess it would be, uh, you're reminding me that that maybe is a good slide to have uh, for a discussion like this so people kind of know where, where these calls are coming from. Um, sometimes we have parents say, uh, well, I'm really glad I found you. You know, it was a little bit hard because, you know, either I had to do a Google search or I had to wait until someone told me about it. And wouldn't it be great if uh, they handed your information out uh, at every district or kept it on the front desk? And um, I, I would agree. I think um, I don't know that we are entirely uh, at that point in terms of sort of the collaborative relationship with schools and districts, I think, you know, we hope to get there someday. Um, because I think my own feeling is that the more uh, information and sources of, um, you know, people to uh, listen and bounce ideas off of and, and get advice is sort of uh, better. Um, so, uh, but at any rate, in addition to uh, the purposes I mentioned before, um, we do a lot of trainings for families uh, and educators, community-based professionals um, about the public education system, special education, as well as a huge area 
Um, and, and that is, again, coming out of this sort of original value that the office sprang out of, um, which was really more focused on um, parent involvement. A lot of the people who were kind of responsible for creating the office were big followers of Joyce Epstein and Karen Mapp and um, kind of that idea that uh, more parent involvement always equates with uh, better success rates for kids. And so I think the way we sort of see it is that, um, you know, for parents to be sort of empowered to participate, whether it's in SPED or just in regular general education, they need information and they need understanding about that information so that they can, you know, really be part of the discussion. Um, so we're, we're kind of trying to close that gap and sort of help parents be, uh, you know, informed enough to sit at the table so that functional discussions can happen and they're not just, they don't come out of a meeting that involved, you know, the valuable time of many, many uh, school educators as well as the family's time and, and people feeling like, you know, their needs, their concerns didn't get on the table and not to say that the entire meeting was a waste of time, but that whatever issues were in dispute didn't uh, move or shift. So we produce many publications um, and right now we are kind of redoubling our outreach uh, efforts to underserved communities um, across the state. A brief note uh, of what we don't do. Uh, we try to be very, very clear with everybody we work with that we uh, do not provide legal advice or services. As I like to say to like me being one of the attorneys in the office, you know that line, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Um, and some parents need some review of that at various points in the process. Um, and not all schools uh, are able to sort of trust and be comfortable um, that somebody with a legal background is not going to wear that hat uh, in a meeting. Um, we don't have any authority to enforce uh, laws or standards. Uh, we believe that we are there to help point them out, remind them to people, sometimes, you know, clarify what they are and ask people to kind of revisit how they are um, applying and implementing them. And we don't have any authority to force schools to take a particular course or action. Again, different than, you know, we, we talk with both uh, parents and people on the school side. Certainly I have discussions with people on the school side where I invite them to think about something that they, with, that, you know, in my senses, they may not be spending enough time thinking about this or they might want to think about their liability in a different way. Um, and, but, you know, we're not there to kind of impose advice on them. And, you know, I think we're really just sort of hoping sometimes to slow the process down and give people an opportunity to hear some different perspective. Um, and then this was a piece that was written into our statute and uh, which is, you know, we don't work on cases related to elected officials allegations of professional misconduct. Um, you know, sure, there are parents who call and they want somebody to get fired. And, you know, we have to kind of explain that that's not something we're going to play a role in. Um, you know, there's a process for that involving the Office of Professional Practices and that here's how that works. Uh, but we might also take the time to say, tell me more about your problem. Maybe at this point you're thinking that the only way to approach this is to get somebody fired and maybe if we spend some time talking about that, I might hear some other issues that give me some ideas of what we could do uh, um, aside from or instead of that. Um, so um, just kind of trying to sort of stick, take stock a little bit. Uh, I know there are other ombuds in the country, some of whom are uh, internal to State Department of Ed. Some of them are district level. Um, so I was just thinking, well, what distinguishes uh, our agency from other ombuds in the system. Um, I think one of them is, as I mentioned, that we address all issues, uh, K to 12, not just special education, uh, which I really value because um, I feel like it, it helps to be able to really take a look at kind of all the issues going on in a kid's kind of educational arena because sometimes the, it, you know, the, the symptom could be popping up in special education, but you might find actually uh, that the source of the issue actually has to do with harassment and bullying uh, or, um, 
or something else that we don't think of necessarily as specific to special ed. Uh, the no investigative or enforcement authority. Um, again, the emphasis on independence and objectivity, and uh, you know, I think one of the things that we most hear from parents is an appreciation that they were able to talk to somebody uh, who could sort of join them in the process and in the system, but who wasn't part of that system. And um, this is not, you know, uh, I'm not passing a judgment on how much do people in the system make an effort to be fair or anything like that, but it's more just kind of a reporting back. Many, many parents, uh, at the point that they're in a sort of protracted dispute, they don't trust anybody anymore. Um, and when, when they get kind of a, um, if, they, if they bring an answer up the, or sorry, take a question up the chain, so to speak, and they get the same answer as they got at a lower part point in the chain, it's hard for them to trust or know um, whether or not this is sort of a form of kind of rubber stamping of, an, of a lower decision or whether they are truly getting an independent kind of, um, you know, sort of de novo review, as it were, of their problem. And so when they learn that, that we are a resource that can understand what their problem is, and, uh, and that we don't have any connection to the decision-making process, uh, I think that's a big relief for many parents. Uh, and often that allows us, so that if, if, let's say that we say to them, well, after everything you've told me, I think the information you're getting is pretty accurate, they can hear that sometimes, or they'd never be able to hear that, especially if it's not the answer they want to hear, right? Um, that they might be more easily able to hear that uh, from um, a kind of, removed third party like that. So again, it was not necessarily that we had to be neutral, because neutral means, in a way, you don't really have a stake in any outcome. And I don't think we would say that based upon our directive to be advocates for fair process, advocates for student outcomes, advocates for making sure that parents who haven't had access get access. None of that really smacks of neutrality. Um, and the you know, impartial, multi-partial thing, I think, is kind of just good, good food for discussion. Um, so what has this looked like so far? This is sort of a trajectory of our caseload since our office started. And um, I guess you can kind of see the basic gist of that. Uh, and this has been actually uh, both exciting for us uh, and an enormous challenge um, because I'll remind you that there are five of us and so we are at a position where uh, five of us are uh, handling between 1,000 and 1,500 disputes um, per year. So what that looks like day to day last year, for example, that we served more than 1,100 students in close to 800 schools, in 185 school districts. Uh, Washington has, I think, approximately 300 uh, districts, located in 36 out of 39 counties. So we were, we were all over the place. And anybody who's in direct service delivery, if you think that there's some kind of sweet spot uh, of demand related to resources, and what that means for how effectively you can serve people, I think we are starting to feel that we are kind of, uh, we've kind of peaked on that and, are, and have been in a little bit of a um, state of discomfort in terms of uh, we would like more time to be able to help people more in depth. I think you know, our work uh, is, in, is meant to be a fairly in-depth thing of not only providing information, but working directly between families and schools to work things out. So uh, in our, this is just uh, in, in the last six months, preparing our um, strategic criteria for the next three years, we had to return to our uh, sort of mission purpose of who we're supposed to be serving and say that moving forward, uh, we are going to start trying to uh, follow some strategic criteria. This doesn't mean that we don't serve everyone, uh, but in terms of targeting our resource sources. So 
so students who experience any of these factors, um, exclusion from school, chronic discipline, truancy dropout, you know, the list goes on. Um, and I will say you don't see special education on the list there. And I think the reason for that is because um, merely being a student with an IEP, that can actually, a student can be doing great um, and can be getting what they need. These factors, when they are also present, are a pretty good indicator um, because you can see that we have academic failure or high risk of not graduating, um, that we've got a student in trouble. And so that sort of allows us to cover that group without sort of naming a category of students who remember our general education students first. Uh, and we added um, students whose uh, parent or caregiver is limited English speaking, migrant, immigrant, or refugee, may be incarcerated or detained, mental health issues. And more globally, when the process uh, is alleged to be or shows indications of being unfair or not followed. You know. And then the very last one, which of course uh, is a big focus at this entire conference, is when the relationship between the adults uh, directly affecting the student's outcome uh, is destructive, hostile, or combative. Okay. So those are, these are all situations where we say uh, we're going to target our most intense resources uh, to those students and families. So how are we doing reaching these families? Um, this is kind of a so far, and I think I would like to be able to come back in a year or two and say that by implementing our strategic criteria, we've able to improve these numbers because what you see right here is sort of really barely kind of status quo for, it, this reflects the proportionalities in Washington, but doesn't show that we are targeting our resources still to a disproportionate number. And some of that is because to date, we've just sort of had a fairly open in everything that comes in. And, uh, you know, parents in special education, especially your white middle class parents in special education, many of them very, very effective advocates and very good at being the squeaky wheel. And I'll tell you, when you are you know, juggling 50 to 70 cases, it can be, and somebody's there saying, help me now, it can be pretty hard to sort of say, who haven't I heard from for a while, or who, who, who am I not serving? Those people are silent, they're not getting to you. And so that was part of us realizing we were gonna have to be more affirmative uh, to kind of overcome that. Um, so this is sort of, remember I said this is a, Big experiment in the offing. We're figuring this out as we go and continuing to uh, clarify what it means to meet our statutory objectives and make a difference. So we are hoping to change the look of that pie um, while simultaneously uh, making sure that we don't turn people away and that we offer everybody some degree of support. And I'll mention a little bit what that level of work looks like. So what are our most common issues? Um, Special education, including 504 plans, at the top. And I'll show you a bar graph in a minute. You'll see just how much at the top. Parent access, discipline suspension, enrollment transfers, academic progress, student safety. Sorry if I'm blocking. Oh, no, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Bullying and harassment. Yeah. So is I'm it, gonna, I just want to, I'm, um, I guess or, or did I, you need that one? Sorry. That's good. Okay. Um, I'm just sort of looking for almost like a concrete example. So what you have is a parent believes that their child is being bullied at school, has discussed it with school personnel, mm -hmm. feels like the school personnel dr has brushed them off, essentially, right? And then they contact your office w with the hope that you can actually say to the school district, this parent is very concerned and, and you know, I'd like to, s I'd like, is what you do say, I'd like to sit down and talk with you and the parent about it. Because if I look back at the prior slides, um, I don't know how to say this correct, politically mm -hmm. correctly, mm -hmm. so I'm just gonna, it's like you, you don't have a whole, you don't have a, a you know, a, right. a, a cudgel to weave, right, 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 right? So what are you going to do? You're gonna say, please sit down and talk with me about this student and parent concern. Yeah, and, uh, and so um, I was sort of starting globally and was gonna kind of get down to the, it's always hard to uh, figure out how you sort of structure, like do you guys wanna hear the sort of nitty gritty of how we work, but um, since you're asking the question now, yeah? 
Or does the school district, do they have some, like a statutory duty to cooperate with you? They don't, they don't. What we find though is that by and large, um, most districts are pretty responsive. Um, and I would just say that lack of district response um, is one of kind of a host of issues that parents cite as to the, why they're having the problem. And um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I don't know whether it's um, our sort of position in the governor's office as kind of a up at the state level that is, you know, I, I guess uh, nobody wants to kind of not call the governor's office back, perhaps, you know. So I, th <laughs> I think we enjoy some institutional authority, as it were. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of times, um, that, just that one piece of kind of, if there's, if communication has ground to a halt and we're not, the parents just not kind of, you know, in getting an engagement from the school, uh, we can nine times out of 10 be pretty helpful with that piece and that often sort of gets the process moving again. So that is one uh, thing of value. I'll spend some time in a couple slides just like really sh sh t telling you like kind of how we work and how we um, in those areas and what are kind of the, the issues that are kind of most underlying the disputes. Yes. They tell us. Oh, that's one of the yeah. questions you ask them? Yeah, because we, remember, we are supposed to gather data on who we serve and what we do. And so we have a database. When we do intake, we gather a fair amount of demographic uh, um, data. So that's with like people volunteering that information as part of intake. Yeah. So you can see the kind of, really kind of a monster of an issue special ed really accounting for a huge amount of what we do. So it's caused our agency to kind of become increasingly oriented toward this arena to be able to be responsive and realizing that uh, whether we planned it or not that way, we are playing a large role uh, in this. And then special education cases by disability category, um, we also see um, a huge number of um, people calling us because their child has either is on the autism spectrum or ha is a ADD, ADHD. Um, I, you know, sometimes I feel like if there was just an, you know, I'm picking up the phone, what's the issue going to be? It's going to be a parent of a student with, in one of those two disability areas uh, who is, you know, cognitively, reasonably high functioning. They want their student to be learning general ed material, but their behavior is so off the charts uh, that they are not you know, the inclusion piece kind of isn't working. What do we all do now? And I'm sure many people, um, you know, find that that's a, that's a challenge facing, facing us, you know, nationwide even. So factors that contribute to special ed disputes uh, that we see, um, a communication breakdown. And, you know, that uh, usually has reached the principal level, but not all the time. Um, you know, again, there are, I think, a lot of factors why some parents sort of will, on their own, kind of go knocking on the door of the principal, and other parents just might not do that. Um, and so uh, we're always going to be finding out, you know, who have parents talked to already? Kind of where are we in that sort of chain of communication? And um, making sure that we include that building principle often, you know, as soon as possible um, to make sure that, that there is, a not, is not an opportunity to work it out uh, at, that, at that school level, you know. Because we are, you know, aimed at getting things resolved at the lowest level possible. That does not mean, however, that we won't move up and down the system anywhere we need to go to get things resolved. And that's kind of another interesting thing about where we are located in the system, this fact that we have this kind of on the ground um, client relationships uh, with people across the state, um, the ability to uh, phone and talk with people at their school and district. But if we, uh, if there's, you know, need for to, you know, go up to the state ed office for, to get questions answered, clarification of regulations. You know, we can really involve anybody that we can think of. And again, that independence, there's no, um, you know, I think 
some, you know, there could be instances of districts being a little not sure they want to, you know, go above them to get help resolving a dispute. Um, so we're not really kind of, uh, you know, hampered by any sense that, well, we should try and figure this out on our own. Um, lack of, so we talked about lack of or inadequate school response. Um, families just not understanding the school system, you know, just not really being clear on, you know, what, what their child's rights are, you know, what certain things entitle them to, what is this IEP, how, what does it even mean, how does it work? Um, and, and then, you know, sometimes uh, school staff not following federal, state, or local policies with accuracy and or consistency, and I realize that's a, you know, um, a judgment call on some level, but um, I spent a lot of time uh, in IEP meetings, um, so I'm not saying this just based on what parents tell me. This is also based on my own um, estimation of things I hear people say in meetings where they will quote regulations wrong, <coughs> where they, they'll say we can and can't do this uh, when that's actually not true according to the law. So, um, and I don't, you know, I think somebody mentioned in the previous session I was in uh, what an incredibly complex area this is. I don't, uh, you know, I think it's very challenging for people to uh, uh, keep up on, on kind of all the all those details. So I mean, hopefully we are there just to kind of raise a hand and say, hey, can we take a minute to review uh, this rule or this procedure and make sure that we're, we're all understanding this. Uh, so what parts of the IDEA 504 process do we see the most conflicts? Certainly IEP issues, but um, as I've heard other people say, we have to remember that there's uh, problems throughout the process. Um, so even we get a lot of people just saying, I'm not feeling like I'm, I'm getting access as a parent um, to, to the process. Um, I wasn't provided documents. I wasn't provided translation. Um, uh, I got one call for a meeting uh, that I couldn't get the time off work and they just had the meeting without me. You know, things of that nature. Um, evaluations, um, you know, we increasingly see that if parents aren't putting these things in writing to districts, um, they're not necessarily getting a timely response. You know, so one thing that we sort of just help people, parents understand um, is sort of the importance of putting important communications in writing. As I mentioned, uh, we certainly see an overlap between special ed and discipline. Um, to understand these graphs, uh, this is almost 20% of our SPED cases involve discipline and then almost two-thirds of our discipline cases also involve SPED concerns. We actually think these numbers are low based on how we were gathering that data last year. We've made some changes to how we'll kind of tag that in our database that I think will actually show those numbers to be quite a bit higher. And then sort of what I sort of think of as like more systemic factors uh, that are driving SPED disputes. This is not, again, so not necessarily just between this parent and this school team, um, but uh, parent participation procedures not being uh, followed, lack of timely comprehensive evaluations. Um, inadequate connection between, we have an evaluation, um, <coughs> statements of needs and goals and services provided, and they don't really all gel together, you know. Um, and including, uh, sometimes we see areas outlined as eligible, but no goals written in those areas. Or we see goals written in those areas, and then no services provided in those areas. So we get into a lot of pretty nitty gritty stuff on IEPs. And it's not to say that that's the be all end all of serving a student, um, but if you believe, as I do, that the IB is a basic contract between the district uh, and a student, and by extension, their parents, and that if they should ever end up uh, in, a, in a, a legal forum around that, people are going to start to look real hard at that language. I think parents need to know that it matters what's in their IEP and that they need to understand that um, and not be surprised two years down the line when their statute of limitations is up, 
that actually this wasn't in, the, it, the, there was never any contract saying that their students should receive these services for the last two years and now they can't raise a complaint about it. Complaints that staff are not sufficiently trained or skilled to effectively implement these services. Um, lack of staff resources and time in the schedule to provide the supports or to gather data on them. I mean, I think, uh, you know, a caveat, are school staff enormously overtaxed? Yes, they are, you know. Um, and yet these are all legitimate problems um, that get raised. And I'm not sure, you know, this is a, a huge systemic problem for all of us to sort of address. I'm not, I don't have a neat answer for it. Um, but, uh, but the, these gaps are definitely occurring. Health plans that don't reach edu educational issues, um, behavior issues that are part of a disability but not addressed by the IEP or 504 plans, um, and parents being told point blank, we can't provide that service, it's too expensive. And you know, it's one thing I think when these things pop up, you know, no system's going to be perfect. I think we are always looking to see where there is you know, this is not a parent nitpicking about something that's overall working great, but where the complaints are accompanied by some concern about actual outcomes and impact on the student. So maybe I should have put this earlier, sorry if people have been wondering this part for a while. How do we deliver our services? We have really two main levels of service that we provide. Um, one is, as I said, that information, education, referral, consultation resources, that's done primarily by phone. Um, it's really helping uh, whoever's on the other end of the line um, to understand the problem, navigate the system, devise a strategy. What are they going to do that might, you know, help reach a different outcome? What are their next steps, right, um, to find a resolution? Um, you know, equipping a parent with uh, manuals and toolboxes that will help them to work on their own. So that's actually, we're kind of beefing up, so to speak, that approach to our services because we're finding we really cannot provide all the services to each person every time. We have to recognize there are some people who, if you spend an hour in a consultative role with them and you hand them a bunch of resources and say, keep in touch with me, let me know how it's going, they can go off and do a lot on their own. And that's great. I mean, I, I think that's, that's uh, um, actually a pretty good um, uh, sort of outcome is to have you know, parents empowered to uh, be their own advocates. However, as I've mentioned, we know that we have parents who that's not going to work for them and that we're going to have to provide, <clears throat> we call it intervention in quotes. I feel like that's a little bit of a, um, a sort of aggressive term, uh, but really it's about us joining uh, sort of inserting ourselves into the discussion, joining the conversation between the parents and the school, again, primarily by phone. We do some very, you know, limited going out uh, in person to IEP meetings and such. I wish we could do more of that because as, um, you know, I was a sit around the table mediator for many, many years and I'm a big believer in the magic of what happens at the table and it involves body language and it involves all kinds of, um, you know, metacommunication and things that are as, a, as a, a conflict resolver, it's like a bunch of the channels are sort of shut down when you are on the phone. Um, but, you know, that's the tool we have to work with. We, we do the best we can, and I think we generally can get most of our work done that way. Um, so, you know, we can be a telephone intermediary, a little bit of like shuttle mediation. Um, you know, we always are going to try and spend uh, an, a chunk of time with the school folks, just as we do the parents to get their perspective in a sort of, you know, pure manner. Um, and then uh, I think it's, it's though by joining meetings is often where everything kind of gets worked out as, as you probably can imagine. Uh, sometimes there's just kind of a straightforward, we've got, um, you know, a transportation thing that, uh, you know, we just need to kind of scrutinize again and say we really kind of, uh, thought of all the possibilities. And um, I'll say, uh, again, I think, you know, s folks in schools just extremely busy. They have a lot on their radar. I find that by us coming in and saying, you know, would you mind taking a second, third look at this situation and just kind of sustaining some focus on it for a little bit more? Um, like, I think harassment and bullying is a great example of an area like that uh, where 
um, a lot of times it's just kind of not um, evolving and moving in a good direction. And when people sort of start to really focus on it more, inevitably this problem starts to work itself out. And I feel that way for the most part um, about IEPs as well. I find that most of the IEP meetings that we uh, join, um, you know, it's things kind of uh, that were a little bit stagnant kind of loosen up. Um, at least some of the issues start to get resolved. Maybe there's a little more clarity on the pieces that are going to sort of um, resist that. Um, and I think, I think sometimes for parents too, just when something gets resolved, uh, either some of it sort of falls away and isn't as important as they thought it was, or then the other stuff kind of uh, follows. Um, in my mediation practice, I always felt like, just get them to agree to something. <laughs> if they can just agree to something, we can start agreeing to more. Um, Um, it's based on sort of uh, the need of the situation. Yeah, we don't go to all of them. So we sort of go through again that um, I'm looking to see uh, sort of how protracted is the dispute. Um, so if a parent calls and it's a fairly new concern or complaint, they've never sat down with their team to raise that complaint. Um, and I you know, through talking with them, I think that they are um, with a little bit of, you know, guidance and coaching that they could be capable of raising their concern and talking about it. I'm going to encourage them to do that first. I'm not, I don't have any desire to barge into every single IEP meeting and, or barge into any of them for that matter. Uh, but, but what I'm looking for is uh, sort of what is the, wh what do I see as the capacity of this team to work independently, does the infusion of some information and understanding on the parent's part, does that kind of shift the dynamics a little bit? So then I might have the parent let me know later, well, how did that go? You know, I encourage parents, for example, to um, not treat meetings as a place where not as a, like this is a drag down, you know, we're not going to leave this room until we get this issue. I say to them, you know, think about this as more of an information gathering. Uh, session. Uh, it's a place for you to share your information and for you to understand as best you can the school's position, why they are agreeing or not agreeing, what are the things they're saying. And when I talk to educators, I say, you've just given me a very, um, you know, cogent explanation. It sounds great. You should be able to convince a parent or at least you should be able to make some progress. Like this all sounds very reasonable. If, you know, let's, let's assume that a parent can be reasonable. Um, have you taken as much time to explain it to them as you just did to me? Um, or have you thought about the way that you're explaining it? Do you think that it's accessible to them? Um, where we sort of see that things are already fairly, you know, the communication is really sort of fraught, you know, and and you know, any team that assembles might be blessed with a few people who are really great communicators. Uh, and similarly, some teams, you know, there's people with other expertise in the room, but none of, nobody there uh, is really like a naturally a good facilitator or is bringing that. And so some teams are gonna struggle more than others. Um, and so I think, you know, we're looking for where, where can we sort of help, you know, with the sort of raise all the boats with the communication piece. Yeah, um, I'm just kind of thinking about as a complaint comes in the front door to you, um, if, if you have a parent that, that seems to be looking for something more direct, I mean, you, you know, and, you, and you've indicated you, you can't really order a school district to do something, but what the parent may seem to be wanting is clearly something that's directed along the lines of like a formal state complaint or something. Mm -hmm. like that. How, how do you screen that through, or how, how do you handle those situations? Um, I, I plan to talk a little bit about how we fit in and around the formal okay. complaint segment. Um, but, uh, well, I, I mean, we, I can wait that's OK. Minutes. No, no, no. I mean, I'm just sort of saying I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little more time on that. But, um, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's a, Right, it's a continuum, you know, and so I think what we really want to help the parent understand is where they are on the continuum at that point in time. So if a parent comes in, if I'm talking with a parent, 
And they're already talking about a formal complaint, if they've heard of that somehow. A lot of them really haven't, but let's say they know about that. I might sort of say to them, that it seems a, like a little premature. I think you've got a lot of steps and process you can go through before you're at a point where that would be a good use of your time, a good use of anybody's time. You know, I, I don't think it's a great idea for anybody to go to a very formal dispute resolution process where um, you know, things are sort of uh, underdeveloped. You know? Their dispute has to be kind of ripe for that. Um, and, and so much of the time, it's really about the relationship, the communication. Um, you know, I have parents who, um, you know, they just maybe are very, you know, they require a lot of time and patience and not all school folks have that or realize that this is what needs to be brought to bear in this situation. And so sometimes I'm trying to help those parents kind of figure out, you know, um, you've got 12 big things that you're concerned about. That's a lot to kind of bowl your IEP team over with in a one to one and a half hour meeting. What would you think about picking your top three to five and writing those up with bullet points and thinking through how, you know, like getting that all pretty clear and bringing that in and distributing, handing it around to your team so they have something written to look at and sort of doing some prioritizing, and this is one meeting, you know? And, that's, and that just can sometimes really make a huge difference. You know, a team is like, okay, three things at this meeting, we can take some time to talk about those. When it was this, you know, 12 page handout from the parent, that, and it was all in this kind of long, rambling, narrative fashion, that's not something that's easy for a team to process. Um, so it's, um, you know, the second bullet, facilitating communication, negotiation. Uh, it, it's really sort of uh, helping parents to learn, you know, how do you uh, get your needs across um, and uh, make it more likely that these folks on the other side of the table I, some, I actually just did a parent training last week, and I said, you need to think about this as a friendly business meeting that happens to be personal for you. But all the other people there, this is their job. Doesn't mean they don't care about your kid, but it is their job, and so rather than be odd man out and be the loser for that, you know, think about how to <coughs> channel all this personal sense of urgency that you have towards being an effective participant in what is, in a sense, a business meeting, you know. And so, you know, people, some parents, you know, through their own jobs and have some practice with that. They know what it's like to type up an agenda and bring that in for a meeting and how, what a difference that makes in people staying on track or even getting your issue talked about. And some have had no experience with that. Um, don't worry about all the little bullets here, but, you know, essentially, we have one point of data intake through our main desk. It gets, um, we take cases on a strictly rotating basis. We don't, none of the ombuds specialize except for our Spanish speaking ombuds on the east side, but uh, we all deal with all the issues just on a kind of round robin uh, basis. Um, we do that data collection piece and then we start working um, on uh, outcomes. And we do, um, uh, we send out evaluation surveys to all of our clients when we close cases and we get that information back and that becomes something that we look at. So uh, I just wanted to kind of, you know, if I was sort of brainstorming like all the dispute resolution tools that I think that we make regular use of, um, it's a pretty wide, uh, a pretty wide range. Um, of course, the reflective listening and restatement and reframing and supporting informed participation, uh, a little bit of limited evaluation. Um, you know, we preface that, uh, but I think some parents need a little bit of uh, reality check on, you know, where does, where does this fit in in the, in the grand scheme of things? Um, and of course that's, uh, you know, we're clear that that's not to substitute for what a hearing officer would tell you if you ended up at that part in the process. Um, but. Uh, we, we feel like it's helpful p for parents to get a little bit of a sense of um, whether or not they are asking for a complete pie in the sky um, or whether or not 
Uh, this falls within the generally reasonable, which doesn't mean that it's that their IEP team is going to reach that conclusion. We reach out to other parties a lot. Um, and then some of these things that I think a lot of mediators do, you know, reality testing and um, helping people kind of get a little bit real about, um, about what, they're, what they're asking for and what the likelihood is. Um, and then I said, uh, some, uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, also helping IEP teams to kind of, um, if they have reached some kind of interim um, agreement on next steps is to make sure that's clear. I find a lot of a lot of meetings with schools are on tight schedules and you've got people drifting out as the meeting is wrapping up and may or may not really reach a clear conclusion. Well, okay, we just talked about a bunch of stuff for two hours and what's going to happen. And so sometimes, you know, um, that's a, something I can do is just sort of point out to the group before we, before we break that it would be great if we could uh, have a little bit of clarity as to what everybody's going to do next. Yes. Absolutely. No, no, that's okay. Burning question in mm. my mind is how much time would you say you spend with each uh, each constituent, whoever it is that you're helping? I'm sure there's a range of yeah. Things, how do you how do you uh, distribute your time right. to provide equitable services? So, uh, with that, you know, it's an issue that we kind of tussle with quite a bit, especially every year when we you know do our annual report and during the summer when things kind of quiet down a little bit is when we can kind of do some of our strategic planning, uh, talk about the way we're working. Um, you know, it's hard because um, different parties and situations sort of require more and less time. So it's sort of hard for us to say, well, there's an allotment of time. I mean, we say everybody is going to get an, that first hour um, of consultation regardless, you know. Um, and then from there, I think it's really kind of a, a need-based thing in terms of um, you know, some disputes, we, we phone into one meeting, have a conversation with the school, do a little follow-up, and we're done. You know, other situations, uh, they go on sometimes even more than one school year, you know. So um, it, I don't think we have found a way to be sort of um, formulaic about that. We do track it, um, not so much in a billable hours kind of, but we, we are able to show, like, the number of contacts that we've had and what kind. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something that we chart in our work, um, uh, generally keeping it fairly, you know, we uh, try to kind of, um, both because of our confidentiality duty um, and as a small agency, you know, we don't want to set ourselves up for incredibly onerous public records requests. Um, you know, often the less data um, in, in that way that you keep, the better. Um, as long as we are kind of, you know, meeting our basic requirements of what we have to report out on. Um, so, uh, but we do, we do track, you know, uh, what, how many client contacts we've made, school and district contacts, community professionals, meetings attended, that kind of thing. And really, um, you know, it's an interesting question, um, the equity piece. I think us uh, revamping our strategic priorities has been our attempt to um, keep that equity piece in mind and not just let the frequent callers dominate, uh, dominate the landscape, because uh, they will. Um, and as anybody, as I said, who has handled large caseloads know, you know, it's your best intention to sort of be completely organized about that and then, you know, you're sort of in the flow of work. Um, so it's, it's something that I think that we, uh, we do, it, it's a challenge we have to kind of uh, deal with. I don't, I don't know if I have a kind of more precise answer for that, um, is that it's something we're sort of aware of and we're just always trying to figure out how to streamline what we're doing um, and make sure that we're not letting anybody fall through the cracks, you know. I have, I have chats with my clients about how important it is for them to kind of bird dog me um, so that those, those clients who maybe are not as used to uh, being in that kind of client relationship, um, if they are expecting that um, they're going to sit at home and I'm going to you know, call them like clockwork every week, you know, to say that's not actually how this works. This is your dispute. I'm here to help you. Um, but, you know, I need you to drive the train um, and let me know when you need help, you know. And, and I think, you know, majority of people uh, can kind of do that. And then we find that some people, um, 
don't have that capacity. And th that, those are hard cases because um, we don't want a student to suffer because their parent um, isn't able to maintain contact or doesn't know how to kind of ask for what they need. So, um, you know, it's, this is messy work. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. Um, and then I said on a limited basis, um, we do do some formal mediations. This has been at the request primarily of some school districts. Um, I, I, being probably the ombuds uh, with the most kind of peer mediation background, I've, I've done a bunch of these where um, there's some kind of school-wide thing going on that might even involve you know parents and teachers and um, so I've done some of those um, at district requests um, you, yeah can you mm -hmm. give us an idea of the subject matter so well there was one um, on the formal mediation uh, one was a parent who rejected the um, she did not she would not mediate with the district using the um, uh, provided for mediation option through uh, the IDEA um, and she said she would only mediate if she could use our office and the district agreed um, so that's how that happened um, and we have you know when we do those um, we have you know developed more formal mediation paperwork agreements to mediate and forms for writing up agreements um, and then uh, school-wide mediation um, there was a school that was sort of struggling around some, um, they were going to lose uh, a program or have restricted access to a program um, that uh, ra raised some real equity issues at the school and it was, it was causing a lot of conflict within the ranks of the teachers, within the ranks of the parent body and so I did a series of uh, sessions with both the teachers as well as the parents, which was really about helping both of those groups, um, you know, uh, have safe, big, safe discussions, I guess. Um, and it was not, uh, and, and in that case, I mean, there was, there was a school board involved. It was not a simple kind of um, equation as far as decision making. And, uh, but, w but one of the things that was necessary was the ability of these kind of sub-communities in the school to all get together and not have it turn into a big, you know, shouting match or, um, and so they wanted someone there to kind of, um, you know, just help facilitate those and, and that, and so played that role. Um, since this term is sort of coming in and I think is a great one for all of us to be focusing on is these upstream opportunities, I was like, well, you know, how upstream are we? Um, so I was thinking, you know, we will generally but not entirely always step back when, from the process if or when uh, a parent hires an attorney. And if I say, well, well, why is that? I say, well, I think generally there's less room for an ombuds to be effective because uh, the process is more likely uh, to turn adversarial and that districts are kind of less, uh, districts are also less open at that standpoint because it's kind of like everybody's sort of girding for girding for the, the battle now, and it's sort of um, at least at the upstream point. You know, again, I think as, we, as anybody who was part of the previous session in this room, talking about that kind of zone after filing and some of the options for people to keep trying to sort of hash it out, but if we're talking about uh, in advance, I think there's definitely a dynamic shift. Um, and then during the pendency investigation of citizens due process and or OCR complaints, um, again, one reason is that now suddenly we're into these very long time frames. Um, it's sort of like uh, the whole thing is sort of on hold. Um, and it becomes just a lot more difficult for us to work between the parties at that point. Although, you know, we're usually sort of in the wings or on the periphery. We don't necessarily just disappear. Um, and I want to emphasize, like, once a parent calls us ever, um, I say to them, we are always here for you to talk to. You know, you can, like, we're going to try and get this worked out right now. We're going to, you know, sometimes life goes on and it's problem free for a little while. But I think uh, anybody who, you know, works in special education knows it's just a big, bumpy, long, <laughs> bumpy ride, you know. And, um, and, I, uh, and I, one of the reasons I want parents to know that is in the hopes that they'll actually call us earlier uh, next time. 
um, because we can be more effective and more efficient, spend less time reaching the same result with them when we're called in earlier in the process before the communication's gotten completely corrupt, you know, fallen apart. And, you know, as I'm sure many of you know working in this area, there's a lot of kind of going back and rebuilding this bridge and fixing this process and plugging in what got, what was missed here. So, um, and we do have people who we get something fixed out one year, things quiet down for a while. Next year, something else crops up. They're going to call and ask for help working with their school and district to get that issue resolved. Uh, and another reason that we, um, the negotiation tends to be a lot more structured. Um, and just the fact that there are other people who are, who are kind of in somewhat overlapping roles with us at that point. You know, we have scarce resources. I can't justify hand-holding with a parent through all of this if they have retained an attorney, you know. I have to say to them, it's not that we do the exact same thing, but you've got somebody kind of to help walk you through this. And so I'm going to move on to helping somebody who has no one to, to kind of uh, help them understand what's going on. Um, and of course, you know, any time where we reach a point where we just sort of conclude that we can't really be effective uh, here, you know, uh, we're not going to, we're not going to sort of, we're going to give it a lot of effort first. You know, we don't kind of back out of things easily. Um, but, uh, you know, so there's, there's always an element of, you know, parents have to have some amount of capacity to work with a service like ours. Uh, so if we find that, you know, for parents' mental health issues or something, we're going to attempt to steer them towards uh, services and say, you know, we're still, again, and we're not sending you away forever, but kind of uh, give us a call when, you know, if, you've, if you get a rap team going and you'd like some input on the school point, give us a call back. I spent a little bit of just trying to um, kind of unpack our process a little bit to show, so on the, on the left, this would be like what I think of as almost like generic nuts and bolts of dispute resolution processes. Intake, explaining the neutral third party role, confidentiality, and then sort of how we at, at OEO, how we kind of hit on those components um, so that I think, you know, through the end of our process, uh, we have actually managed to, um, you know, check a lot of the, of the key ingredients that lead towards uh, dispute resolution in my, you know, since I have kind of a long grounding in mediation practices, I'm actually a pretty big believer in that process. It's not an accident that when you follow the steps of that process with some fidelity, about 80% of the time across a lot of different disciplines, 70 to 80% of the time, you get parties uh, resolving. And so um, it's always kind of helpful for me, and actually putting this together was helpful for me to see that in fact we might might do it a little bit differently, um, tweak it to our needs. But, you know, for example, leveling the playing field. For us, that looks like making sure that parents are informed participants. Do they understand SPED laws? Do they understand the process? Do they understand not just that, but how to navigate it? Because there's a lot, it's not just a playbook that you press play. You have to kind of understand, you have to understand what's coming next. Some parents, they're brand new to this process and they're flying blind. Part of it is saying, here's what's happening now. And here's what's going to happen next. And here's what's going to happen down the line. And there's thing, you know, you can be, you can learn how to sort of be effective at each step of the process. Um, and this one actually, sorry, this one ends up really being huge. I'm kind of always amazed when I do get into the level of joining meetings, um, how much that organ, that that common base of information is missing. You know, um, and. Um, you know, even sometimes, uh, you know, outside reports uh, haven't been shared or the team hasn't really sat down and gone through them. Um, there's documents the parent hasn't received from the school. It's kind of like, well, no wonder this group is having trouble getting this sorted out. I mean, you know, these are pretty basic ingredients. If you don't have that, a team can't really uh, work through. And this one, too, you know, um, it's not agreements in an informal, you know, IEP meeting, et cetera, um, you know, they it might just be an issue that gets agreed to. Um, but a lot of the times these things don't get written down. Um, we don't really have a sort of idea for what the steps are going to look like. And so I'm really encouraging um, schools 
and parents to sort of take that extra time to make sure that all this time they all just spent doesn't then sort of fall apart um, the next day. Well, and so then what if agreement is not reached? Um, of course, um, we, we do spend time with parents if we've, whether um, they're, they call us and they're kind of already at that point legitimately <laughs> so, or they get to that point after working with us for a little while um, of sort of helping them understand, here are your options from here. You know, we're not going to be your, uh, your, your close uh, hand-holding person at this point, because that's not what we do. Um, but here's a little bit about what you can expect. Here's where you can go for more information. Our state ed agency has really great uh, information online, so we generally just will pull that up and, and walk them through it. I mean, that's, that's the thing. A lot of the information is out there, but it's you know, either intimidating, it's not as clear as one might think at first glance, and so you know, we do a lot of walking people through, I call it kind of document review, but it's walking people through their own documents so that they actually understand what they mean. You know, let's, like IEP 101, you know, what is this section, what does it mean? What information should generally be there? You know? um, and so we'll do the same thing so that people at least head into the formal dispute pro uh, resolution process with an idea of what it's all about, you know, um, and uh, it's, I, I'm always a little bit torn, but um, I feel like these, so many parents cannot afford lawyers. We can't have this be a process that is only accessible to parents who can afford lawyers. I think we're, you know, collectively as a field hoping to find, you know, solutions to that. In the meantime, I'm not entirely satisfied with telling every parent who can't afford a lawyer, well, you should just give up on that. So if I meet a parent who is uh, reasonably articulate, shows an ability to understand the information, has some advocacy energy, um, is, is sort of, you know, I can tell that they're kind of, they're willing and ready to kind of go the mile. I'm going to encourage them to do it. You know, I'm going to say, listen, this is not a, pro this is not a process. You should know it's not an, an entirely easy process. You should know what you're getting into. Um, but I'm not here to tell you that because you can't afford a lawyer, sorry, that's not, this is, this is your due process. You know, I don't want to send you on a fool's errand either. Um, but, you know, maybe you can do this. You know, don't, don't just necessarily, you know, throw up your hands. Um, and we should be regularly, um, you know, coming to the system, people without lawyers, and saying, work for me, make this work for me. And I hope that, uh, you know, I don't spend much time in those hearings. Once in a blue moon, I've had um, hearing review officers and school board level review, like, ask us to sit in and sort of be an independent source of information, and that's always kind of interesting. Um, but I have to hope that um, there is some fairness in that process and that, um, you know, parents can get their questions answered. Sometimes people are like, well, I don't know what to do because this meeting is coming up. And I'm like, well, explain to the judge what you need, you know. Maybe they can give you some extra time. I think we, do we finish at five? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's a couple minutes away. So I'll, I think we're almost to the end, though, anyway. Um, I was just trying to kind of put that upstream piece exactly on the uh, IEP in 504. Um, so that looks like understanding where the gaps were in their IEP process. Again, that documents review. Um, I think we've, we've kind of covered all this, helping communicate with school officials. Yeah, and kind of it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, pulling, pulling their team together. Um, understanding who needs to be in the room. I mean, anybody who's meeting, who needs to be there to reach a good uh, solution? And sometimes not all those people are there. And so I put down uh, how our services kind of compare uh, at this stage of the formal process. How are we doing here? Oh, and then I think we're pretty much at the end. Value added. Um, we get a lot of positive feedback 
that it was actually incredibly helpful for somebody to, to just listen to their concerns, provide them feedback, independent perspective on the situation, inform me about the laws and policies, and then up here is working to resolve the problem, facilitating discussions. Some of that, those numbers, you have to kind of remember that we don't get directly involved in every single one of our cases. So um, that's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I know that was a lot of me sort of talking at you, but thank you for the questions you brought. Um, and I hope this gave people sort of a flavor for how uh, you know, one state has created a you know ind independent outside of the education system ombuds office that is managing to be quite involved and part of the fabric and um, you know ho hopefully uh, part of the part of the solutions we're all looking for. So thank you very much.